Guy and Robin stacked the castle's broken furniture in the grate on the second level. Robin used his flints and got a fire going. They huddled on the stools until the fire began to warm their weary limbs. It was only as they began to feel warmer that they realized their exhaustion. They had not eaten since that morning, but all they had found to consume in the castle was the late Lord Brackenbury's secret stash of wine. Guy had learned to open bottles of wine at the same time he'd learned to handle a blade, to comport himself around women, and to understand the finer points of tax and the exchequer. Once the fire was going, he was pleased to demonstrate the method to Robin. Beside the fire stood a number of tools for moving logs and ash. He reached for the yard-long pincers. The pincers were made of iron, the claws where they met narrower than Guy's little finger. The axle was about a hand span from the end, the long handles making it easy to exert a lot of pressure on the claws. Satisfied, Guy pushed the claw end into the heart of the fire and sat back on one of the stools. We'll have to bury Lord Brackenbury, said Robin. In the morning, said Guy. Yeah, said Robin. In the morning. They sat in silence, watching the end of the pincers slowly glow red and then yellow with heat. Guy wrapped some cloth around his palms before lifting the pincers from the fire. They still glowed brightly as he swished them towards the line of wine bottles. Deftly, he opened the claws and closed them round the skinny neck of the first bottle of wine. There was a hiss as the pincers touched the cold glass. He saw the glass curve, melting where the hot pincers pressed into it, and with a quick twist of his wrist, he cleanly severed the neck of the bottle. Robin scooped up the decapitated bottle and sloshed its contents into two pewter tankards. The wine tasted thick and mushroomy. It might have been good, it might have been awful. Robin and Guy were too hungry to care. They glugged it down greedily, and Robin refilled both their tankards. As Guy twisted off the top of the second bottle, Robin raised his tankard in a toast. Lord Brackenbury, he said. Guy raised his tankard, clunking it against Robin's. A brave man, he said. A fighter to the last. Robin looked up at him. Yeah, he said. They glugged back the thick red wine. You're not so bad, really, Robin said to Guy. To Guy of Gisborne. And all right, said Guy, sloshing wine into his goblet. To me. The third bottle shattered, wine exploding all over Guy's legs and feet. Robin howled with laughter. Grinning, Guy put the pincers back into the fire and readied another bottle. Bottle four, or five, depending on how you counted, was a heavy, gritty wine. Guy thought it might have spoiled, but he couldn't be sure, so they drank it anyway. Besides, he didn't want to put Robin off mid-flow. And you used to have that great black and leather thing going on, he said. I was stubble, and even with the moody thing, I know you're all right, really. You could just lighten up a bit. Guy had lost count of the bottles now. What you got to understand, slurred Robin, falling back off his stool to land abruptly on the floor. He sat there befuddled, not quite sure what he'd just done. Then he looked up at Guy. What was I saying? You, uh, you were saying, said Guy. He furrowed his brow. Something. Guy was preoccupied, trying to line up the red-hot pincers with the neck of the next bottle in line. Only two bottles remained. Guy couldn't understand where they'd all gone or why they kept dodging the pincers. He kept glancing at Robin to make sure he wasn't playing some trick. Yeah, nodded Robin emphatically. And what you got to understand is it's not just anyone could lead a band of men like mine. Well, they're not all men. This Kate, she's, she's not a man, but that's not the point. If I wasn't here to lead them, if something happened to me, well, what would they do, eh? Guy nodded. Yeah, you've got a lot of responsibility, he said. Exactly, said Robin. Respo resp I've got what you said. It's not like I can be replaced or anything. 
Guy wasn't exactly listening. He'd found the bottle of wine couldn't move so quickly if he closed one of his eyes, but closing one eye also made it harder to balance, and the pincers were getting heavy. He aimed carefully, one eye closed, and the pincers smacked hard into the neck of the bottle, knocking it over on its side. Sighing, he put the pincers back in the fire and leant down to pick up the bottle. And as he bent over, the blood rushed to his head and the room swam away from him. He started to explain to Robin that no, he hadn't had too much to drink, but as he hit the floor, even the explanation felt too much like hard work. A stork watched them from the window. It sat in its nest, ruffling its feathers with its huge long beak, gazing down curiously on the two men with its black, beady eyes. Guy raised his head slowly. But that didn't really seem like a good idea, so he put it back down on the floor. His head hurt. His teeth hurt. His mouth felt like he'd been chewing gravel all night. He didn't even want to think about the rest of him. But the thing that really made him feel sick was the noise. First, there was the terrible rumbling just beside him. Robin lay on his back, snoring for all he was worth. Second, from outside the window, Guy could hear shouting and calling. The words were tangled in his ears so he could not understand them. He knew they were words, not just random noise. He knew they were telling him something. He strained to make sense of them, and part of his adult brain recovered enough to realize the voices weren't speaking English. They were shouting and calling in German. That thought was what made him feel sick. Here he was, lying on the floor with an almighty hangover. Robin lay snoring in no better state, and the mercenaries had caught up with them. They made their way slowly down the creaking wooden stairs, leaning against the wall where they could. Guy's head pounded. His stomach clenched and gurgled. His legs didn't quite move like he wanted them to. Robin shivered beside him, an awful jaundiced look in his eye. They were hardly in any state to take on a cohort of mercenaries. Rain drizzled down as they emerged into the courtyard. Grey daylight blazed into their eyes. They could hear the shouts and cries as the mercenaries hammered at the castle gates. Open the gates! The mercenaries shouted in heavily accented English. Yes. Guy led Robin slowly to the stone steps reaching up onto the walls. They took the stairs slowly, Guy not daring to look down. They crawled to the gatehouse overlooking the gate, partly to conceal themselves from the men below, partly because it was easier than standing. Peeking through the spy holes, they could look down on the mercenaries. There were maybe two dozen of them, tall, well-built men who looked like they'd seen a few battles in their time. Their shouts pounded inside Guy's head. It's most of them from yesterday, he whispered to Robin. Yeah, said Robin. We must have caught them up to something they don't want anyone to know. Or it's just that we saw them all, said Guy. A crack unit, trying to keep themselves secret. But who were they working for? We could ask them, Robin suggested with a grin. Maybe, smiled Guy. Probably best they don't know we're here, said Robin. Guy nodded, which was a mistake, the state that he was in. Spots of green and purple burst in front of his eyes. He reached out for the wall with one hand and grasped the chain hanging in the shadows. The chain squeaked as it yielded to him. And from under the gatehouse there came a great crash, and then a huge yell of horror. Beside Guy, Robin barked with laughter. He had his head pressed to the spy hole. Guy leaned in close to get a look too. The mercenaries stood soaked to the skin. The chain had unleashed some tank of cold and rank water on top of them. Every man dripped with oily, stinking gack. It glistened from their hair and skin and clothes, rainbow patterned in the light. The mercenaries stared at each other in fury, not knowing quite how to respond. Guy saw them clenching their fists, working up some kind of response, and then 
As one, they let out an enormous roar. Robin withdrew from the spy hole to check the chain system. There's another two chains, he told Guy. I guess that means we've still got defences. Wait, said Guy before Robin pulled back on the second chain. That's all we've got. Right, said Robin. It looked a lot better, Guy noticed, for their having caused such mischief down below. Guy kept his eyes on the mercenaries as they backed away from the castle gate, withdrawing back across the rickety bridge over the river. They huddled under the canopy of trees so he could only see their legs, but they were clearly discussing their next move. He saw them arguing. He saw them miserably cold and angry. He saw them withdraw back into the trees until he could see no trace of them at all. Two men remained crouched in the undergrowth, watching the castle and scowling. They've gone, he told Robin, but they've posted sentries. So, they'll be back soon enough, said Robin. We could try to escape, Guy suggested. We're in no state to run away, Robin told him. They'd catch us the moment we left the castle. Guy nodded carefully. He felt rotten. And now, they'd picked a fight with a whole army. All right, he said. We sit here. We need to be ready for them, said Robin. But what have we got to use against them, pondered Guy. There's just the two of us. They don't know that, do they, said Robin. We just need to convince them it's not worth their while. And how are we going to do that, said Guy. Robin grinned that infuriating grin. Trust me, 